Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat 107, featuring part three of my interview with the Sensible Software founder, John Hare. In this part of the interview, we cover a lot of the games from the Sensible Software catalog, including Wiz, uh, Wizball, WizKid, and of course, Sensible Soccer. Got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. John Hare. We were talking a, a little bit before about the, uh, you know, the Sensible catalog and mm -hmm. how the games are so wildly different from each other. You know, which mm -hmm. I think is uh, which I think is great, but I wanted to you know briefly go you know at least mention a few of these because they all have their fans that <laughs> want to hear about okay. you know the okay. story. So uh, I guess we'll start with uh, with Parallax. Uh, so what yeah. you, you know what's the story behind that game? I know it's got that. I just uh, listened to that uh, intro music again, which is just fantastic. So it's amazing. It is amazing. Uh, I mean, that Parallax music. It, it even now it sends goosebumps around you it's kind of like it's so good i mean martin was a genius on that machine you know making the sid chip sound like its own instrument and he was a massive tangerine dream fan massive tangerine dream fan so all of his music is kind of inspired by that kind of sound and um i think that uh parallax was for me it was it was about designing levels and doing the art i was i, I did all the art for the first seven years of all our games so right the way up to sensible soccer i even did the art for so all the way up to sensible soccer is all, all, all my art in the game apart from a couple of screens in megalomania um and so the, really parallax was mostly about chris and the programming he did i mean chris was you know chris yates my, my partner at, at sensible was it was it was an absolutely brilliant commodore 64 programmer he was you know he was a genius programmer and and it was so easy for me, I guess, to 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 and now allowed me as a as a creative person to to work with someone who could deliver technically great stuff. And Chris was very creative himself. I mean, you know, we 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 co-designed certainly all of those games on the on the Commodore 64 uh, and WizKid as well. Um, we you know we were a creative partnership. We were we were. <coughs> I was thinking, I don't know if we were Lennon McCartney or Chaz and Dave, but we're certainly a, like a songwriting partnership. That's how we worked. And um, Parallax was uh, was basically Chris showing what he could do on a Commodore 64 in terms of movement and, and stuff, and us finding our feet in terms of level design and bits of metagame design. The bit where the guy gets out of the uh, spaceship and walks around to the computers is a bit basic and not quite maybe what... <clears throat> what we initially had in mind but it was a it was it was a good start you know and we we got the humor some of our humor in the game i guess we chris and i've got a very similar sense of humor so it, it couldn't help but showing in the games uh chris was very very dry and he would um when we <laughs> when we finished parallax uh we were very very on the edge of memory and we had needed a message to tell you that you won the game. We had no reward for the end of the game. And Chris just came up with this message in about 10 bytes, which said system off at the end on the computer. And this tiny little screen, that was it. That was your reward for going through the entire game. It was, it was very anticlimactical. And, 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 and I think that, um, I think that the way he and I worked, we so naturally understood each other, what we were doing. It was, we didn't have to, consider things they just kind of happened they just evolved you know and parallax was a start i'm, I'm pleased with it as a start and we got a lucky break on it we went to we went to ocean uh in 1986 in 1986 when we set up sensible we went to ocean on a train to manchester which was a fair trip for us we were 19 years old and they signed the game up the day we went there our first ever business meeting here's a check here's a contract you're in, you know, we were extremely lucky. They give you a good deal or do they try to screw you over? Oh, they screwed us over big time. We, <laughs> we didn't know, you know, we, 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 we got a check for a thousand pounds. We went back on the train. In those days you could smoke on trains. We were smoking cigars in the dinner cart on the way back. We thought we'd made it, you know, we got a, we, I think the whole deal was 5,000 pounds. We got a thousand pound up front. We never saw a penny of royalties. Of course. Um, but it was our lucky break. 
I can't complain. It's, it was, you know, everyone needs their start, and that was our start. And and, and I'm, I've always been grateful to Ocean for that start. You know, and, and to get Martin's fantastic music in there was just a totally lucky bonus as well. So yeah, then you made one of my, you know, we were talking earlier, one of my favorites, Wizball, mm-hmm. which one of the amazingly, you know, fun and original game. I can't imagine anything like that. I don't know, even know how you would uh, describe something like that to try to get it past the first. Uh, you know, the first wave of rejections, right, with the publisher's <laughs> database. So, yeah. what, what, how did you, how in the, in the world did you come up with this uh, whiz ball? The concept. Well, actually, it's, it's, at the time, for, in terms of getting it signed, we signed it with Ocean, who we just signed Parallax with. So, it was like our follow up. And in those days, they didn't want a huge document before you signed the game. I don't think we had a document when that game was signed. They just said it was a bit like, it was a bit like signing a music artist. You didn't say, well, what's going to be on your next album, Mr. Bowie, before we sign it? They just said, okay, mate, you're pretty good. We'll have your next one, please. You know, bearing in mind, this is how we, we were thinking as musicians, really, in this respect, you know, expect, anticipating the world to be like this. And it was. And it was much better when it was like that. I've got to wait. Anyway, so Wizball, at that time, we were playing a lot of arcade machines. It's still arcade machines were very dominant. And Chris was a big fan of like Nemesis and Salamander and these kind of Japanese um, shooters at the time, space shooters. And and Wizball basically was inspired by Nemesis. If if you if you look at the game Nemesis and look at the way some of the waveforms work and some of the weapons work, it's very much inspired by Nemesis. The bouncing ball was something which Chris had been developing. One day I came to his house. We used to work in his house in his spare bedroom. And uh, and uh, he had this mechanism going of this thing bouncing and rotating. He was playing around with it. And uh, I think I must have drawn that green ball face as an idea, which showed the rotation off quite nicely as it happened. And, and that kind of started. And then we had the idea for the catalyte, which initially was just kind of like a, almost like a, a bomb or some kind of thing which you moved around your... Uh, ship, and then it, we enabled that to fire as well, and then we enabled it to go out and collect stuff. I love the cooperative mode on this ball. I think it's really good. You know, it's. Uh, I think it was one of the first games probably that had that kind of cooperative mode in it. Um, and then the, the idea of colouring the landscape in. This is kind of more my area of innovation in in, in this ball, I guess. Um, so initially, um, you know, in Wiz Kid, Wiz Kid. when. When you play the most kid, yeah. far out game we ever managed to get out. That is truly eccentric. Wiz, Wiz Kid is Wiz Ball's son. Yeah, it's just, literally the story. There's a, there's a very twisted story I can tell you about it later. But um, in Wiz Kid, you've got this game like Arkanoid where you, where you you're ahead, like Wiz Ball, and you. And you bounce bricks and you destroy, you know, you bounce things to destroy bricks and clear levels. But then there's another bit where the background of these levels, you can you can grow a body from your head and start wandering around the background and exploring and going into the background. And it's like a small adventure game with picking up objects and stuff like that. It's a very, very unusual game. I recommend you play it. If you want to understand the full expression of me and Chris working together, play with kid. That is, is, is it, the game. It's totally um, based on inspiration. And this alchemy I mentioned to you, just making stuff happen. Just having an idea, yeah, that'll work. Let's put a crossword in there. Okay, why not? Put put in... It, it, it's very bizarre. It works. It's original. It's more... It's, you'd think it's more of a Japanese game, I guess, in kind of some of the, the way it works and the quirkiness of it. Um... And so, yeah, in, in Wiz Kid, in Wiz Ball, sorry, originally I wanted more of what happened in Whiskey, which is where you start to wander around and explore. And the idea, again, of mixing the paint up and getting the colour, I wanted more interaction within another part of the game where it wasn't just the spaceship. And in the end, we just reduced it down to the collecting the colour, mixing up the um, paint and then painting the landscape, which basically came from just playing around with art, you know, playing around with making it grey and colouring it in. It gave it a nice theme. Um, and often you find that, you know, 
the best games in those times, and actually I believe the best innovative games which will happen over the next five or ten years, come by the process we used to work, where we didn't write it all out at the start, where we weren't expected as part of our contractual obligation to whoever was publishing our game to define everything we were going to do at the start. I mean, Gary Bracey, we worked with at um, Ocean, as a producer, was so open to what the hell we wanted to do. He just loved it. He thought it was funny. You know, he got our sense of humour and he encouraged us to to express ourselves, uh, which is fantastic. You know, if it, it's what you need. And, and uh, um, uh, I, I think with, with Wizball, we just, we just managed to have interesting ideas, nice looking art for the time, very good controls. It's in, if my one criticism playing it back again is it's too hard at the very start. It really is demanding. That's why it wouldn't work in the current market. The, the, the learning curve at the start is too steep, which is, we could retune it, I guess. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you yeah. should make it. I was wondering if you could make a version with the iPhone that you know, so you would, uh, you know, sort of rotate the phone like that to make the, uh, to make the ball go to make, up and right. to make the ball to put the spin on it. Yeah, know? yeah, I, th I think we could. I mean, the, the thing is, you know, I believe people talk to me all the time about new versions of Canon Fodder, new versions of Sensible Soccer. I am always looking at those and they, you know, there's a chance some of those will come up in different formats from time to time. They always have done for me, so there's no reason for it to stop. Uh, or our game Sex, Drugs and Rock and Roll, which never came out in the end, or, you know, Whizball or Megalomania sometimes. I think the truth is, you know, every game has its time where it worked. And and within the frame of when Wizball came out, and see the time when it came out as part of the frame of what it was, of it coming out, it was great for that time. Now, it's a retro remake. I look at Speedball. It's a brilliant version of Speedball that we've done. I'm very happy with it. Um, but the game is, is a game that originally came out in 1989. And, you know, uh, if we took some music which came out in 1989, and put it out there and pretended it was new, people would go, that's not new, that's music from 1989. You know, that's old 80s music. And I think we have to understand that something like Sex, Drugs and Rock and Roll is a really good case in point. It was a massive game, it was highly innovative. To me, it was the next stage on from what WizKid was. At Sensible, we had two strands of games. We had our safe games, like uh, Sensible, so Sensible Soccer was a safe game. Micropro Soccer was a safe game. Um, shoot up construction kit in its own way was fairly safe we had these kind of like steady things and then we had out there games like Whizball, Wizkid Sex, Drugs and Rock and Roll would have been another out there game and and we tried to keep a balance you know you can't in, in the same way people would keep a balance these days between doing work for hire or original games we tried to keep a balance between Games which were just pushing the boat out too far for most people and games which were more safe, like Sensible Soccer. And it was good for us to have the balance of the two. Um, it certainly kept the creative energy up in, in the company right to the end. Now, you'd mentioned the shoot 'em up construction kit, mm -hmm. uh, which I, I think that's a really, it's not really a game, but it's, it's a really, I wanted to talk about It's fascinating. And, you know, I, it's obviously it was a big hit. I remember playing a lot of the games uh, that people made with it. Uh, most yeah. notably, uh, Smurf Hunt. <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> <I'm not laughs> <I'm not. laughs> Love Sorry. that. Have you played uh, Smurf Hunt? I take it you have. I've not played it, no. No, no. Oh, wow. You should. <laughs> it's infamous. <laughs> you go around doing Smurfs, I, okay. I take it, yeah? <laughs> yeah, it seemed like I got it on one of those uh, public domain uh, disc packs. It used to come with magazines. And okay. and there was a Smurf Hunt. I was just like, what the hell is this? This is great. You know, I can't. You know, of course, I, I don't think this was an officially licensed. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't think so they, who, they got the, the permission to uh, kill the Smurfs on this. <laughs> I remember actually a terrible admission when I was, must have been pretty young, when the Smurfs were popular and I was 10 or whatever. I remember going to a, a wedding in our family, some second cousin's wedding. And I remember me and my sister requesting the DJ to play that Smurf song at the wedding. You remember it? <laughs> la, 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 la. That's amazing what you can remember. <laughs> the crap you can drag out of your mind. Yeah. So, 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 shoot up construction kit was 
Well, it was pretty simple. The reason it was made was because Chris was trying to make a utility for me to be able to make games, to design levels, to do the art on. And actually, I started using what he'd done, and you know, I think I must have said to him, "This is really good. You know, we we can release this as a as a product." And so, what what happened was that Chris basically finished off the utility, but as a commercial product, and uh, and I just made four demo games. It was it was good for me to learn about level designing, attack wave designing, and taught me quite a lot actually. I like. Um, some of the games on it. There was one called Celebrity Squares, which was appalling. Um, but I quite liked Slap and Tickle. Well, I like the name. And uh, the funny story about Shoot 'em Up Construction Kit is 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 a bit of a uh, uh, an attack on US coding. Okay, I think in those days that there was a difference between the US and UK approach to coding, and the UK programmers very much tried to do it very efficiently in minimal absolute minimal memory and and we found that the u.s coding well i learned from this one experience was maybe not quite as tight i think we can now see that amply demonstrated in every version of windows around the planet the lack of tightness in coding anyway the um shim up construction kit basically loaded in one load just all loaded at once however commodore had just released that blocky brick of a disk drive. Do you remember the breeze block disk drive? And um, and when we did the American version, the NTSC version, uh, they complained that the disk drive light wasn't flashing on and off when they were playing the game because they expected to see it loading to show that this bit of hardware that they'd bought was, was, was functioning. So Chris had to fake the light coming on and off to pretend it was loading. <laughs> <laughs> to get it approved. Oh that's wow! My, <laughs> that's my crazy story. That 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 game was um, our first number one game, actually. Shoot 'em up construction kit. So very fondly remembered for that reason. Yeah, I remember a lot of the games that were they were made with that. Uh, it seemed like there was a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles one. <laughs> uh, and this must have been all like they just ripped off the licenses, right? But, of course they did. I'm sure they didn't pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was still lots of fun. Now, while we're talking about these Commodore machines, I just wanted, you know, uh, to clarify why you preferred the the Commodore 64 and the Amiga over the Atari STs and all the other stuff that was out there. Okay, well, as I mentioned to you earlier, the Atari ST was popular in France and Europe and not so popular in the UK. And in the UK, we used to refer, it, refer to it as a door wedge because of the shape. Um, it was known for having a better um, sound chip, but not much else. Um... I don't know. I mean, uh, I guess we just had Commodore, so I was used to it. And we always did ST versions of all our games. But we always, Commodore was the first format. It was the prime format. It's where my focus went. Because as soon as we got to conversions, I kind of just switched my focus to the next game. I didn't, I didn't look so much at conversions. I would just run my eye over it once or twice during the development. Um, my focus has always been on the next thing, the next game, you know. Um... So yeah, I don't know why Commodore was just Commodore was the label we fell in love with until it blew up. It must have been really sad when the Amiga finally just died, right? Did, did you take a long time before you uh, switched to DOS? Or we Windows? were we we were so heavily in bed with those machines. I mean, we I say this, I think it's accurate. We were the top developer in Europe on the Commodore sixty four by the time the Amiga came out. And we were very slow to adopt the Amiga. By the time the Amiga ended, and we're talking about 94, 95 now, when we stopped working on it, you know, some people would abandon it two years earlier than that. Again, we were the top developer in Europe on the Amiga when it stopped. Um, and we really got caught with our trousers down, I guess, because we just hadn't had any need to do real 3D programming or, you know, having bigger team sizes. We, we, we'd gone from being... Uh, a top developer on the machine to like novices at 3D, novices at big team management. Um, and the only reason we moved is because we were offered four times more money to move on to these other machines. I mean, that's why we did it. There was just, we were totally disincentivized to make those games and those machines. As it turned out a few years later, to be equally disincentivized from making original games as opposed to licensed games. It's just kind of 
when the market forces refuse to part with money unless you do what they want, which I suppose it's their, it's their choice, it's their money, you know. Um, but yeah, we, we never did the PC stuff internally. The PC stuff was always um, a port which was done in a different company uh, it, uh, in Yorkshire, in the UK. And uh, again, that, that I guess cost us because we never pushed PC and, and in retrospect... Had we pushed PC more, we'd have possibly got more of a profile in the States than we ended up with, which would have helped us in the long term. Certainly helped me personally in the long term to have more of a profile in the States. You know, it's it's frustrating and boring for me to have to tell people, yes, I've had 10 number one games, but you never heard of any of them. You know, and the biggest one was a soccer game. It just it just doesn't <laughs> work in the States. <laughs> yeah, sensible you know? soccer. I guess it wasn't called sensible soccer. I mean, you, you didn't name it then, right? Yeah, it was a championship football or something like that in the states. No, in uh, in Europe. Oh, sensible soccer. Oh, it was sensible soccer in Europe and the and the US. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you know, sensible soccer made the name sensible software worth more money. To be honest, I mean, we we we, we had already had Micropro Soccer, which had come out before, <clears throat> and actually we nearly signed Sensible Soccer with Virgin, but Virgin wanted to call it Virgin Soccer, and we said no, we wanted to be called Sensible Soccer, and when Renegade. Who who were a great company to work with. They they um they were basically formed by some of the guys from um uh, Rhythm King Records uh and the Bitmap Brothers. And they, they worked like an indie record label. They were they were great and they, and they, they were happy for us to call it Sensible Soccer and they gave us the best royalty deal we'd ever had and it was our big hit. So I just wonder why soccer instead of football? I don't know, actually. Well, Micropro soccer, Sensible soccer, FIFA soccer. I don't know why. I think I don't know why. No idea. For us, Sensible and soccer kind of went together better than Sensible. Sounds good. Cool. Um, but uh, I don't know why. I guess the term football, obviously, in the states, is a different sport, so it would be confusing to to, to just use the word football. Um, I don't really know. Um. What can I say? <laughs> that sensible soccer, it all worked. You know, it was the one that really worked. So I'm glad we did everything exactly as we did it. I wouldn't have changed a thing. <laughs> sensible soccer. I was, I was wondering. Is that? I guess that was the biggest hit for you guys, right? Oh my god! I mean, it's a huge franchise. Sensible soccer was. Um, sensible soccer was the top football game in the world for about two and a half years. And actually, until the first version of FIFA came out on the Mega Drive, we were number one. FIFA stole our crown. You know, we remember it. People will forget this. But um, th there's a particular point which, which I've never fully forgiven myself for. And it's always led me to wonder if there were other things really afoot here. But we submitted to S Sega the Mega Drive version of Sensible Soccer. And it was due to come out a couple of weeks before FIFA came out on the Mega Drive for the first time, okay? And I'd taken a bit of artistic license. I noticed the Italian and the French flag were the same. There's just like red, white, blue, and then uh, red, white, green. And when you went between them, they looked very similar. So what I did was I flipped the Italian flag around so it went green, white, red. And they rejected our build on this basis. The flag was the wrong way around. And by the time we'd put, gone through the whole submission process again, we came out after FIFA Soccer instead of before it on the Mega Drive. So how much that dented our overall impact in consoles, I've got no idea. You know, that, that one thing, I've seen the screen sometimes appear on my computer and it makes me angry. That was, that was the potential moment when we lost dominating, because we never really had the same impact on consoles. Any of our titles, really. They, they did okay, but they never really, really got to where we were and I mean for people in the States to understand where we were a sensible software between 1992 between June 1992 and June 1995 that's a three year period with the combination of sensible soccer and cannon fodder and sensible world of soccer and cannon fodder 2 sensible software in the all formats charts in the UK were number one for 52 weeks of that three-year period so we 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 pretty much were dominating 
with all of our titles. You know, we took we took a year of year worth of number one out of a three year period. So it's very weird for me when I when I talk to American guys who don't know our titles. It just happened to be, and it wasn't just in UK. It was in Germany, in France, in Italy, in Spain. You know, it just happened for us. It just didn't happen out really that much outside of Europe. But yeah, we were we were right up there until 3D came along and consoles came along and the expectation of what people wanted changed. Um, and we just weren't, that just wasn't the kind of stuff we were making. It's a bit like a change in fashion of music and you're just playing the wrong kind of music. You know, you're the, you're the, the, the metal act when people want rap, you know, mm. unless you can do one of those <laughs> decent, there's a few good metal and rap combos that have come out actually over the years, but unless you can get that working, you you're not really anyone, you know. So that's pretty much what happened to us. I think, you know, I don't, I'm not really a sports guy, but even I like a sensible soccer. I mean, this is a really, it's just a fun game, right? It's not really for, you don't have to know a lot about uh, soccer, I think, to, to enjoy this game. Uh, whereas, I, I th- yeah. I think what was really good about sensible soccer was that in terms of the playing, it was very instantaneous, it was very fast. And actually, I believe when you play it, the speed of okay all you're doing is moving your fingers around like this when you play the game you know you're not really running or expending much energy but the speed of decision making when you play real soccer <clears throat> you feel under pressure you're making very quick decisions about making a pass getting the right curve on the ball or going in for a tackle or whatever and i think the psychologically i think sensible soccer replicates soccer better than a lot of the modern games well the modern games do I'm talking about by modern, I'm talking about FIFA and Pro Evolution Soccer, not exactly modern, but what those games do is they give you the role of soccer as an armchair watcher, looking at it from a TV perspective, not from a player's perspective. What Sensible Soccer does is it puts you on the pitch like you're a player. You can see your teammates around you, you can choose the pass you're going to hit. You know, Sensible Soccer, the angle, always means you can see everything you can interact with. And you're, and you're under time pressure to execute, which is much more like the real world of playing football. Um, what, what FIFA and Pro Evolution do by default is they take the TV angle. You're the spectator. You're sitting in the crowd or on, on your couch at home. And, and, and interestingly, obviously, more people can relate to that than being a player. Um, but I think the action part, yeah, it's, it's fun. A lot of people have said, I'm not into sports, I'm not into football, but I like the game. The other thing about Sensible World of Soccer, which really is our best game, is Sensible World of Soccer. The depth of data accuracy was unparalleled for many, many years until we got football manager and championship manager. We we had we had in Sensible World of Soccer in nineteen ninety five, we had twenty seven thousand players from all around the world, fifteen hundred teams, every league professional league in the world we could get data for, including El Salvador down to division three, you know accurate data on player names, their positions, their values. Um, so for anyone who loved soccer as a sport, which I do, the, the depth of detail was, was, was amazing. But I think, I think what we did right was we managed to make it so it worked, even if you didn't care about that layer, you, just, you, you weren't aware of it, it wasn't in your face. It didn't alienate the non-soccer fan, and it, didn't, and it was sufficiently near the surface, this data, that it appealed to the real soccer fan. So I think we got that balance right, you know, that it appealed on both levels. And I think that often, for me, sometimes what I struggle with now when I'm making games is I've had so much experience, I guess, over the years of, of learning ways to do things, ways to structure things. Um, I've done a lot of consulting, as I said, with a lot of companies over the last 13 years. And when you sit down with people who are junior programmers who've only been working for a year or two and they're learning, it's fun if you you think that you're taking the role of teaching them and working with them and bringing them on as a, as, as a professional. That's great. But when you're trying to express your own creative stuff and you're dealing with someone who's trying to learn a lesson you learned over 20 years ago, when you keep on repeatedly doing it, it's very frustrating, you know. And 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 I think that I think I found that quite the most difficult thing to deal with since Sensible Software went, and actually not just since since it went since 1995, since we got 
a whole bunch of people in who weren't as strong uh, in the company is dealing with people who are not brilliant. When you're used to dealing with people who are brilliant, people who are not brilliant are, are, are frustrating because you can't really, you know, I'm a guy who has ideas and can draw a bit of art sometimes and knock up tables and talk. I can't make any, I can't make the computer do anything. I can barely make the bloody printer work, you know. So you're relying on all the technical guys to, to be brilliant at what they do. And, and it is really frustrating. I'm sure I'm not the only person who thinks like it. It's, it's immensely um, hard to keep your optimism up. When in your heart sometimes you're thinking, I know it's not good enough. I know it's not that 98% game that we had before. Even if it's only 90%, it's still not 98, you know. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have to let your standards decline with reality. Unless someone happens to give you, I don't know, $20 million and a team of great guys and say, okay, we trust you, go and do what the hell you want, you know. That's my dream, but I don't think it's going to happen. So I kind of understand that's not going to happen now. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with the fourth and probably final part of this interview with John Hare. Got a lot of stuff to cover, including a very special musical surprise that you definitely don't want to miss. So stay tuned. Also, uh, last week I was in Bogota, Colombia, presenting at the campus party. And I owe it all to quite possibly the nicest man in the world, Mr. Dave, uh, David Arcilla. Uh, David showed my wife and I, our wife Elizabeth and I, all around Bogota, saw all kinds of things. I got the pictures up on Facebook if you're on that. Uh, more than welcome to take a peek at those albums. It's a really, really lovely time. Uh, the campus party itself was, of course, amazing, but it was my first time out of the country, <laughs> so had a pretty much a life-changing experience, I think. In, in all honesty. So, special thanks to David. Also have a toast this week from Chad. And, uh, Chad, I'm not really 100% sure how to pronounce your last name, but I did some research and apparently <laughs> it could be Menichi or Menichia. So I hope one of those at least is, is correct. And if not, very sorry. You can blame it on the Cosmo that you had me drink. Here I am at the <laughs> a local Applebee's in uh, St. Cloud, Minnesota. So uh, special thanks to you, Chad. Um, I really appreciate you guys donating and contributing to the show. It really makes a big difference, uh, not just to me, uh, but I think also to you. You'll find that if you donate, you will enjoy the show 10 times more than you do right now, proportional to the amount that you donate. So if you've donated already, thank you very much. Uh, if you haven't, uh, please do so. I would really like to have it. I thought I would leave you with a quotation from David Bowie this time, and it goes something like this. I don't know where I'm going from here, but I promise it won't be boring. <laughs> See you guys next week. So with the nucleus of uh, some of his friends, a 17-year-old David Jones has just founded the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Long-Haired Men. Now exactly who's being cruel to you? Well, I think we're all fairly tolerant, but for the last two years we've had uh, comments like, darling, and uh, can I carry a handbag thrown at us? I think it's just had to stop now. <laughs>